Yeah, my name is Bjorn Iemans from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Uh, and like you mentioned, we have Ryan Reba with us as well. He's the team lead and he'll be available during the discussion uh, for, for, for questions and answers. Um, let me start with, with showing you a slide what CASA is. So CASA is the Common Astronomy Software Applications for Radio Astronomy. And it's basically the primary data processing software for the VLA and for ALMA. But it's a, it's a very versatile uh, piece of software. So it's very frequently used also for, for other radio telescopes. Um, as we heard in the introduction, I will be speaking on behalf of, um, of a large team. We have about 30 people uh, in our CASA team. And, and my colleagues work at, at various places. So at NRAO in Charlottesville, at NRAO in Socorro, uh, at ESO in Munich, at NAOJ uh, in Japan. And we also collaborate with, with a group at JIVE in, in Europe, who, who uh, takes care of, of VLBI development. Um, trying to go to the next slide, it's, it's stuck, there we go. Um, Apart from a large team, CASA also has a, a significant group of stakeholders uh, to which we, 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 uh, we have to, to listen. So we have ALMA users, we have ALMA pipeline, we have VLA users, we have Science Ready Data Products, which is a, a group at NRAO um, that is aiming at, at developing pipelines and integrating this with archives in order to, uh, to offer users Science Ready Data Products. Um, we have VLBA as stakeholder. Uh, we have ARDG, which is the Algorithm Research and Development Group at, at NRAO, which basically makes new algorithms for CASA. And of course, we have general users. And then general users also uh, are part of the CASA Users Committee. So we have a Users Committee uh, with eight people that, that, that meet with us once a year and that provide excellent feedback and advise the CASA team uh, in terms of CASA development and priorities. So I just wanted to show you these, these few slides to, to show you that the CASA project is a, is a big project and we need to set uh, priorities um, for, for the, all the requests that, that come in. So in this talk, I will, I will start with giving you a basic introduction on radio astronomy. I wanna tell a little bit about radio interferometry because a lot of what we do is is really to support uh, radio interferometry and the complex kind of kind of things that come with that. Um, then I'm going to, to CASA and I wanna give you a basic overview of the CASA software and what you can do with the CASA software. And in the last five minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the future of radio astronomy and, and also the future of, of CASA and, and the next generation infrastructure that our team is, is busy with at the moment. Okay, so when we talk about radio astronomy, um, we're really talking about observations done in, in the wavelength regime between about a millimeter and, and about a few tens of meters. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, uh, for most of this region, the, the atmosphere is transparent. You can use ground-based telescopes and, and, and going towards longer wavelengths, wavelengths, often in any kind of, any kind of weather. Uh, towards the millimeter regime, we need to put instruments high up in the mountains, like for example, the, for example, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Um, now, most of, of, of us, of course, know the sky from optical observations. Our eyes work in the optical, and if you look at the sky, you see a sky full of stars, and, and if you're lucky, you see maybe a galaxy. Um, if you would be able to look in the radio regime, you would see a completely different sky. For example, if you would be in standing in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you will be able to see a structure like this. So this is the nearest radio galaxy. It's Centaurus A. And you can see this enormous structure. It's about the size of 16 full moons. And a structure like this is completely hidden uh, in plain sight because we, we don't observe it. Uh, our eyes don't observe it, radio wavelengths. Um, but what you see here are giant plumes uh, of charged particles that are being expelled along magnetic fields. 
And these plumes come from jets that originate in the center of a galaxy. And you see here a picture with the galaxy in the very center. It looks like a small galaxy, but it's actually a, a big galaxy. Uh, but these huge plumes are, are enormous structures that come from the central region around the, the black hole. So these black holes, they send out large uh, uh, jets of, 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 uh, of magnetic fields. And along these field lines, uh, you have these charged particles that reach enormous uh, distances. And in this image on the left-hand side, you see a lot of, uh, of background dots. Those are not stars, those are radio galaxies like the one you see in the foreground, which is much farther away. Uh, another thing you can see in the optical, you can, you can see 3D imaging of gas around galaxies. So here you see an example of a few galaxies in the optical, they, they look quite isolated. When you put your radio telescopes, you can see all this gas around these systems. And, and this gas is produced in this case by, by neutral hydrogen. And the hydrogen atom has, has, has a single electron, which can flip its spin and send radiation at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. So you see all this gas appear. And, and apart from neutral hydrogen, radio telescopes can also detect molecular hydrogen, for, hydrogen, for example. So that gives you a bit of an idea uh, what you're looking at in the radio regime. Um, and of course, you need a telescope. Um, the, the, the more simple telescopes are single dish telescopes. And here you see a, a few examples. Um, the biggest radio, the biggest single dish radio telescope in the world is actually in China. It's a 500 meter uh, instrument. And, and these are fantastic instruments to, to trace large scale structures in the universe. Uh, the resolution, that means the, 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 the ability to, to really distinguish a uh, small scale structure is set by, by your wavelength over the size of your dish. Uh, so the bigger your dish is, the higher your resolution, of course. Um, but you need to take into account that in the radio regime, um, the wavelengths are still an order and still about a thousand to a million times uh, uh, smaller than uh, larger, sorry, than in the optical regime. So for example, if you compare an image made with the Hubble telescope with, with an image made with the, the largest radio telescope single dish in the world. And again, this is a fantastic instrument for tracing the large scale structures in, in relative detail, but really to, to target the, the detail of optical observations, you won't reach there. You would need an enormous dish, the size of, of, of a country in some cases. So what you can do in radio uh, astronomy, you can actually split up your antenna. So basically what you do is you, you put a lot of different antennas and you link them all together. And this is basically called radio interferometry. Uh, and you can do this in the radio regime because you can uh, down convert the signal and, and enhance it. And this is something you cannot really do in the optical with, with single photons. And in this case, you now have a radio telescope that all of a sudden has a size uh, that is set by the longest baseline length, okay? So now you can all of a sudden get enormously high resolution as long as you put your, 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 your dishes far enough apart. But you have to keep in mind, this is not a single dish. You have a lot of uh, space in between um, on which you don't have any, any information. And I'll get back to that later because that's a, a big part of, of uh, data processing and then processing software. So just a few examples of some, some in, interferometers working in the, in the meter regime, in the centimeter regime. In the middle, you see the very large array at centimeter wavelengths. Uh, you see on the right-hand side, the uh, ALMA, which works at five kilometers high in the Atacama Desert in, in the millimeter regime. Uh, and you, you actually don't need to physically link these telescopes. You can just put them all across a continent and, and look at the same object at the same time. And you have a so-called very long baseline interferometry. And of course you can put a addition space as well. So you can reach baselines up, up to, to 20,000 kilometers. Now, all of a sudden you now have telescopes that can have an enormously high resolution, something that you can never achieve in the optical. And of course, we all know this famous example of the accretion disk around the black hole in, in M87. Um, so that's a bit about radio interferometers, but, but let me go into a bit more detail on how exactly an interferometer works, because also this is important for understanding your, your data reduction. 
Uh, so suppose you have an interferometer and you have two elements, two antennas, which look at the same source in the sky. Now, if your source moves in the sky, uh, your antennas move with your source, uh, but you can see that the wavefront that arrives at one antenna uh, has a, very, a slightly shorter path length than, than the wavefront that goes to the other antenna. So these waves can either uh, arrive um, in phase or out of phase. And once you start moving your source across the sky, uh, the, the signal drops in phase and out of phase, and you get a kind of an, an interference pattern. And, and the further you put your antennas away, uh, the more this interference pattern is, is squeezed in and then the higher resolution you will, you will get. Now with two antennas, it's rather simple. You see that in the top right hand plot, if you just point your, your, your telescope straight up and you let, two, uh, you let a source uh, slew through your two element interferometer, you get this fringe pattern. And of course, the amplitude rises when, you, when, when your source comes into your field of view and drops out again. Um, now add a few antennas. If you have three antennas, all of a sudden you have three baselines that you put together. If you have four antennas, now you have six baselines. So the more antennas you put, you, you start building up a so-called point spread function. Okay? Uh, and that gives you a lot of information about, about uh, what you're observing. Um, now the source itself in the sky is often not a point source. Often the source you look at has a, a lot of structure as well. So that adds to this complex wavefront that you observe with your, with your antennas. Uh, and ideally, you want to have a telescope that you can actually rotate and actually scan your source to get even more information on, on what you're looking at. Now, of course, that's impossible uh, to do, but you can actually use the Earth rotation to, to, to slew your telescope under your source and, and track it on the, on the sky like that. That's called uh, radio synthesis. Now, a term, a term that, that you hear a lot in radio astronomy is visibility. Okay, and the visibility is basically an interfer uh, the interfer interferometer response uh, for each antenna pair uh, over a certain short time interval uh, per channel and per polarization. And basically what it is, it's the Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution. So you have this wavefront that comes in and you observe that with your, with your interferometer. And what you collect is a, is a whole set of visibilities. And these visibilities are complex, okay? They have an amplitude term and, and a phase term. And by collecting these amplitude and phase information, you get information on the source brightness and the source structure. And in this talk, I'm not gonna go into the, all the mathematical details. So just wanna, wanna bring it across uh, conceptually. So one thing uh, to keep in mind is that you can get very large data sets when you observe with an interferometer. Um, for example, if you have n number of antennas, you have n times n minus one number of baselines. Typically you need to record a visibility every three seconds. And you need to often slow over several hours to even half a day in order to, to take full advantage of the earth rotation. So you get a lot of visibility, especially if you have a lot of channels as well. So you have very large data sets. A typical data size of 100 gigabytes for an observing run with, for example, the VLA is absolutely not unusual. Uh, another thing is that you're doing a discrete sampling. So I showed you before, you, you link all these antennas together, but you have a lot of space in between where you, you don't have any, any information. So what you get is not really an image of the sky. Um, you, what you need to do is iteratively reconstruct a model of the sky based on the information that you do have. And this is computationally expensive. So that's something to keep in mind. Radio data software has to deal with large data sets and with computationally expensive algorithms. So that was a bit of an introduction on, on radio astronomy and interferometry in particular. Um, I wanna get to CASA now. So CASA is a software package uh, that works for both single dish and interferometry telescopes. And CASA is built on top of, of CASA core. So CASA core originated from, from APES++. And again, APES++ originated from, from APES, which, which has been very successful software for the VLA. Uh, but APES++ uh, was, was at some point converted into, into um, 
what started to become Casa Core and, and Casa. And Casa Core is still the original Apes of Us libraries. It's a stable platform, nearly static. And as the, as the name tells you, Casa is built on top of that, but not just Casa, uh, a lot of different uh, software for radio telescopes is built on, on Casa Core. So CASA itself, which is which, uh, which our team uh, works with, is uh, is a publicly available software that's implemented in C plus plus and which is accessible through through Python through an IPython interface. Uh, very basically, uh, the basic level of CASA consists of CASA tools, and tools are nothing else than C plus plus functions linked to the the Python interface, and they perform specific operations on the data. Um, on top of that, you have CASA tasks. And CASA tasks are, are really the user-friendly things that, that you want to work with. So these are bundles of tools or Python functionality that perform well-defined well steps in the data processing. Um, and often they consist of, of a whole number of parameters that the user can, can tweak to get, the, to get the result they want. And I'll show you an example of that uh, in, in one of the, the further slides. Uh, in addition, CASA has a number of GUIs, graphical user interfaces, to visualize and examine data. And CASA also depends on some external data, uh, like reference frames, ephemeris data, B models. Uh, every CASA version has such a minimal uh, repository included. Uh, but, but users often uh, sometimes need more accuracy and they can update these, these external repos uh, manually. And finally, I want to just point out that, that CASA is also ideal for scripting and pipelines. And in fact, one of the, the, the key functionalities of CASA is support of the ALMA calibration and imaging pipelines, VLA pipelines and, and imaging pipelines for the VLA Sky Survey. Okay, so, so what can you do with CASA? You can do a, a whole lot of things. And, and, and it com basically comes down to, to, to these kind of um, big, big um, groups of things you can do. You can import, export data. You can get information from your data. You can manipulate data. You can calibrate your data, which is an important part of your data processing. You can image your data. And of course, you can do a full analysis of your data. Um, I'll go in a bit more detail in, on, on these items. Um, of course, um, you can do single dish observations, but I won't focus on that in, in this talk. There's not, more, not enough time to, to cover everything, unfortunately. Uh, and same for simulations. You can do simulations in CASA, but I won't be talking about that either today. Um, so let's start at the top. Uh, what kind of data do you import? Well, typically, uh, CASA imports data from ALMA and the VLA, which is given in the science data model. So you have your observed data, which is a set of, of visibilities. Uh, you have metadata and you have auxiliary data, which basically are things like, like uh, pointing corrections and things like that. Uh, CASA can read this into a so-called measurement set. And the measurement set is, is really the basic structure of, of CASA uh, how it operates on the data. So CASA measurement set uh, has tables and subtables, and the main the main column is the data column. That's where your data is stored. But you have all kinds of other columns. So an important one is your model data column, where you can store a model for your data or for your flux calibration. Um, another another one is is the corrected data column. Uh, where you can store calibrated data. So once you do a, a data calibration, you, you, can, you can put it in a separate column and leave the, the actual raw data untouched. And there's many other columns in, in such a measurement set. Uh, and measurement sets can also be created from certain, from certain FITS files. Um, once you have your, your data in CASA, you can get a whole lot of information. Um, and the, the basic thing is that CASA always keeps a log file. Uh, so whenever you do something in CASA, it's written in that log file and just written to, to the directory where you, where you open CASA. Uh, and that same log file also shows on screen. So there's a logger that, that, that is opened with CASA and that shows you all the, the information. Now on top of that, there's, plen there's plenty of, of uh, other tools that you can use. Uh, and in particular, some GUIs 
uh, like this one, like plot MS, where you can basically plot your visibilities in, in all kind of kind of ways. So this is really useful for inspecting your data. And something like this can also be used for manipulating your data. Uh, one important point of manipulating data is flagging. And flagging in radio astronomy is simply uh, discarding certain parts of your data for further calibration and, and data processing. And for example, you need to do that when you have big interference. So radio frequency interference is a serious issue in radio astronomy. If someone is standing with a mobile phone next to a receiver, uh, you'll see a whole lot of interference and all kinds of things interfere with radio data. But fortunately, a lot of this, this uh, in RFI, so-called RFI, can be flagged out. It's often in a particular frequency range or a particular time range or a particular baseline, and it's, it's, it's doable to filter this out. Now, once you, you, you flagged all your data and have a clean data set, you need to, you need to do some calibration. And this is a, a main part of data processing. So I told you before about visibilities. You have your set of visibilities that you want to work on. But those visibilities are actually the signal that the telescope eventually sees, the detector. Um, this, is, this is not at all the, the wavefront that was initially um, uh, released by, the, by your, by your um, astronomical target. Because on, on the way to Earth and also in the telescope itself, a lot of the distortions are, are being added to this, uh, to this signal. And you kind of see that here, and it's a very simple representation, but you have all kinds of different things that add up that distort your data from things in the atmosphere, the troposphere, or the ionosphere at, at long wavelengths to, to, um, to, um, to just components in your, in your telescope and also your bandpass, uh, your frequency dependent gains, your, your, your bandpass uh, response and things like that. So you wanna correct for all this, to get an ideal set of visibilities that you can image. Okay, so here is, here is just an example of a way you can do that in CASA. So you have your input data set, and then you put that into input data set through a number of CASA tasks. So you see here a few, Sedjanski, Benpass, Genkel, these are all CASA tasks. And for example, Sedjanski sets the flux calibrator models to the right scale. Bandpass corrects for your, for your bandpass response. Gainkel uh, uh, corrects for your time dependent gains, etc. So let's have a look at one of these. Let's have a look at Gainkel just to show you how CASA works. So if you want to do a gain calibration, you go to your command line in CASA and you type the, the, the Gainkel, the task Gainkel, and you, you give certain parameters that you want to specify. So for example, your visibility data set, you put in the, in, in the, in the VIS parameter, you give the spectral windows and channel ranges that you, wanna, that you wanna work on. You give a reference antenna and you tell CASA to, to work in a certain mode, in a phase mode. Now that's basically all. You hit enter and gain call is being performed on your measurement set. And you can do this on the command line you can put this in a script, or you can even use a Jupyter notebook. I'll get back to that uh, a bit later. But this is the basic way of, of how CASA works, how the CASA tasks work, the most user-friendly part of CASA. Uh, there's one other way you can do it. You can actually um, give a command INP on the command line, and you get the INP for gain cal. And what you see here is all the parameters that you can that you can set for the for the task gain cal. And you see a lot of these parameters are just the, the default parameters. You see them in black. Uh, and the ones that I actually changed, you see in blue. So those are different from the default. And those are actually the same as we saw in the in the previous one on the command line. So this is an even easier way to get an overview of what you're doing in this task. You type go and gain cal performs a, a gain calibration on your, on your measurement set. And you do this for all the tasks that you need to, to calibrate your data. Now, once you have calibrated your data, uh, you have this ideal set of visibilities. And uh, now you wanna image your data. 
And there's, there's quite a bit involved in, in imaging, more than I can cover in this talk. But you need to grid your data, you need to weigh your data, uh, you need to do a Fourier transform, uh, deconvolution and restoration. Um, and, and that can be done within CASA with one task, which is T-Clean. So T-Clean is a very powerful imaging task. Uh, and it can do all these things for your transform grading, deconvolution, primary beam correction, data weighting. Uh, if you have a look at T-Clean, at all the parameters that you see here, uh, you can see that you can set things that, that control the gridding or the de deconvolution. You can set whether you want primary beam correction or not, uh, how you want to weigh your data. So this way you can, you can uh, get the image that you, that you intend to, to get out. You run T-Clean, it takes a while to, to get the image, uh, but it, 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 it's something that you can really play with and, and change to your, to your liking. Now, like I said, I don't have time to go into detail on all these different steps, uh, but I do wanna uh, tell you a little bit more about deconvolution because it's important for understanding how T-Clean works. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with going to the next slide from time to time. There, there we go, okay. The deconvolution is, is based on the idea that you, you convolve the sky brightness distribution with your point spread function and you get a dirty image. So the dirty image is basically the, 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 the most basic output that you get if you, if you run T-Clean. Um, now you wanna deconvolve the, the dirty image. So what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna take the dirty image and you wanna use the point spread function to deconvolve uh, into a, a model of the sky brightness distribution again. So you wanna reconstruct the sky uh, model by iteratively deconvolving the dirty image using your, your point spread function. Now, the way that CASA does this, So the way that T-Clean does it, it, it starts with your data uh, and then it uses gridding and weighing uh, and eventually an inverse Fourier trans transform to, to get your, your dirty image. So this is your dirty image uh, with the PSF clearly visible. And what you then wanna do is uh, deconvolve then in the so-called minus cycle. So very simply said, what you're basically gonna do is you find the, the brightest peak in your, in your image you scale your PSF and subtract it, but what you do is actually the flux of that, that component you put in your model. And once you've done that, you go back and, and go to the second highest peak. So you really construct a model this way. And the way CASA works is, the way T-Clean works is that from time to time, it takes that model image, does a Fourier transform back, uh, Grits it back to, to, to a visibility data set, which is then subtracted from the data and you get a residual data set. And then you continue in this major cycle, again, a set of, of minor cycles to deconvolve. And this is how you iteratively build up your, your final model image. And, and eventually when you have a good enough model image, you restore it back with a nice Gaussian function that doesn't have all these side lobes that you see in the, in the PSF. And it's, it's, it's very hands-on uh, about how you want to deconvolve, how deep you want to go, which region you want to use. So you can set all that within, within T-Clean. But this is just to give you a bit of an idea of how this imaging works within, within CASA. So in the, in the end, you, you, you have your image and you want to do some an, uh, analysis and visualization. So CASA has a, a nice CASA viewer, uh, which can be opened within CASA and you can do most of your stuff. Uh, it is getting a bit old and, and, and a little bit buggy. And there's now uh, a new software that is under development, uh, which is Carta. And this is software under development by colleagues of ours at, at Asia A, at IDEA. So Asia A is in Taiwan, IDEA is in, in South Africa, uh, and some activity at NRAO and the University of Alberta as well. And what they are doing is creating really a next generation uh, visualization software. So it's the cube analysis and rendering tool for astronomy. And this is really meant to, to deal with very large data volumes. For example, VLA, sorry. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, this is this this is to deal with very large data volume, for example, Alma, VLA, but in particular also SKA uh, pathfinders. And uh, I would say, especially to, to to the younger people that may be listening, it's it's really worth uh, looking this up and and starting to get familiar with the Carta software because it, it really is the the next big thing in in radio in visualization tools, especially in the in the radio. And it has a lot of functionality that the, the viewer has, not quite all the functionality yet, uh, but Asia A and IDEA, they're really pushing and, and development is going really quickly. So I would I would definitely urge everybody to, to have a look at this and get familiar with, with this new visualization software. Okay, so that was a bit of an overview of the different things that you can do within, within CASA. Like I said, I didn't have time to, to go over everything. But hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea of how, how CASA works and what you can do with the CASA software. Uh, if you're interested in getting the CASA software, you can go to the CASA website, casa.nro.edu, uh, and you can download uh, the latest release or really any release that, that you want. So the CASA team uh, has a new release. We, we aim for, for a new release every, every other month or so. And, and this is rather new. Uh, so far, we, we used to release every half a year or so, but we, we're really uh, switching on to this, this new release cycle uh, where we get more releases out so, so users don't have to wait so long for, for, for bug updates or features that are included. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a few ways to, to download your data. If you, if you just want a, a package with everything in there, a Python environment, a simple plug and play, TAR file, you just download the TAR file, open it, and start CASA. Very simple. Um, some people want more flexibility. So we now also have pip wheels for CASA TARS and the CASA tools. So you can install your tools and TARS within your own Python environment, which opens interesting possibilities also for Jupyter Notebooks and the notebooks within Google Colab, for example. You should also be aware that some versions of CASA have pipelines, while others do not. So in particular, Alma and VLA, they, they, they have pipelines that they want to include with, with CASA. And we do that only for certain versions. And if you interact with Alma and VLA staff, uh, they may uh, recommend you to, to work on certain CASA versions because there is a certain pipeline included. So be aware. If you download CASA, some versions may not have any pipelines, while others have, have official pipelines for Alma and VLA. Um, in terms of operating systems, we officially support, have always supported Red Hat and Mac OS. And we try to keep up to date with the, the last two uh, releases of, of, of these operating systems. Um, but we're really moving into a direction where we want to become a bit more platform agnostic. So we know, for example, that the majority of our users uses Ubuntu. So we're moving in the direction of offering support for Ubuntu as well. And we have this, this table overview, which I will show you in, in the next slide we have in our CASA documentation uh, that we keep up to date on which operating systems we, we believe should work with CASA and which we, we, we offer support. So if you, have, if you have trouble or run into a bug, please have a look at, at this table and, and if your operating system are in here, then just contact us and, and we'll have a look at it. And finally, uh, again, another thing I don't have time for, but of course, parallel processing is also possible in CASA to the MPI environment. Now I mentioned CASA docs. CASA docs is the official CASA documentation. Uh, so we recently switched CASA docs to a, to a new GitHub environment, so it has a, has a bit more modern look. And so you can get all the information you need from CASA docs. And the CASA team is developing code against CASA docs. And we do some very, we do all the verification testing against CASA docs. So CASA docs should be the, the primary resource to get uh, the information you need from the software. And we, we, we will release a version of CASA docs with every minor release of CASA. So we build up a whole database and the documentation is, is set for each version of CASA. 
Um, a few things that are interesting to know from Casa Docs, we have a known issues page, which can be found under the release information. So if you run into trouble, uh, please have a look at the, the known issues page and, and, and it may be already known to the, to the team. We also have uh, installation instructions. So a bit more instructions on how to install Casa. And like I told you in one of the previous slides, we have this compat compatibility uh, page as well. Uh, of course, we have uh, a definition of our external interface uh, API, which gives you information on, on all the, 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 the processing uh, interface, CASA tasks, CASA tools, and, and other information. And I think most people actually use the CASA task list to get details on, on the tasks that they're running in particular, for example, the parameters that you need to fill in. So every CASA task and also CASA tools you have a clear description in, in CASA docs. And you can actually call that page of the, the particular CASA task also from within CASA with the doc command. And you get a, an overview of the parameters, a description of the task, examples, et cetera. Um, oh, and just to, to highlight, we also have a set of CASA memos, a knowledge base, and, and some community examples. So this is an... Uh, interesting new thing that we added to Casa Docs where we start to collect notebooks and, and, and give examples of certain workaround solutions or, or tips to, to users. So to summarize, if you, if you have any, any questions or you, you, you need to know something, the, the, the first resource to look at is Casa Docs and, and the Casa website. Uh, in addition to that, there's also some very interesting CASA guides, which, which give you telescope specific uh, strategies for data reduction. And these are very useful if you just want to know how to reduce, for example, a VLA or an ALMA data set. Uh, and, and these, these uh, data reduction guides are, are being kept up to date by the ALMA and the VLA instrument teams. And these instrument teams also run the help desk, the NRAO and ALMA help desk. So if you have uh, questions, particularly on data reduction with CASA, uh, you can send a ticket to the help desk. And we're actually setting up a bug report system now. So users can also submit tickets directly to the CASA team if they encounter anything like uh, a bug or they want to request a feature. But it's still a little while before that's up and running. Now, if you're interested to be uh, kept in the loop actively, then I would uh, encourage you to subscribe for two email lists. We have a CASA announce email list uh, on which we, we send CASA announcements or release announcements. Uh, and we have a newsletter email list. So we try to send out a newsletter twice per year. Uh, interestingly, um, the newsletter is going to be sent out tomorrow morning US time. So that's probably overnight in, in China. And either tomorrow or Friday, we're also gonna send out the next CASA release. So if you're interested in this and you subscribe today, then you probably receive a bunch of emails in the next few days. And finally, we are of course very interested in, in getting feedback from our community. So we have a, an email address, casafeedback at nrao.edu, uh, where we welcome any, any feedback from, from, the, from the user community. Um, I'm having five more minutes on the future of radio astronomy. I hope there's a five more minutes time to cover this. Um, so the, the future of radio astronomy is actually looking very bright. Um, there's several uh, big instruments that are coming up. Of, of course, we have the, the square kilometer array, which is a fantastic new instrument. Uh, and there's also the next generation VLA coming up and also other instruments like the DSA 2000, which is a survey instrument in the, in the US that's under, under, uh, under consideration. So the, the future looks bright. And I wanna, I wanna just point you to, to this next generation VLA idea. This was very well ranked by the, by the recent decadal survey. And it's basically being developed at NRAO uh, and it's a, it's a big instrument. 244 antennas of, of 18 meters. I hope I, I still have the correct latest numbers there. Uh, but it will be operating in the regime between uh, 1.2 and 116 gigahertz. So right in between the frequency regime of on the one end SKA 
and on the other hand, Alma. And this is an, an, an interesting regime where you can target uh, a whole lot of, of, of unique science cases. Uh, the maximum baseline will be, will be uh, 9,000 kilometers, uh, really a continental array. And you get very high resolution. So, so one very interesting science case is that a next generation VLA will really be, be able to image uh, protoplanetary disks around stars, really up to a resolution where you can start tracing Earth-like planets uh, in, the, in, the, in the terrestrial uh, zone around, around nearby stars. Uh, another very interesting science case and quite unique is that the, the, the centimeter wavelengths are excellent for tracing star formation in, in galaxies. And exactly that same wavelength range uh, is also excellent for tracing molecular gas throughout the universe. And molecular gas is, of course, the raw ingredient for star formation. So there's a lot of, of discovery space to open. And, and there's this nice uh, review book by, by, by Murphy et al. It's, it's edited by Eric Murphy. And, and this is basically a collection of, of all science cases from the community um, that were also handed over in the in the decadal survey. So have a look if you're if you're interested in that. Uh, I want to focus a bit on on the processing things related to this. So the data rates of such a next generation VLA will be large, in some cases tens of gigabytes per second. And of course, this poses challenges also for for data reduction software. Uh, so just keeping that in mind. The CASA team uh, has started to think about infrastructure for next generation CASA software to, to really meet these growing demands of next generation radio telescopes. Uh, so this is the CASA next generation infrastructure, uh, infrastructure project. Okay, and it is based on new data structures for measurement sets and, and image contents. Uh, so it's fully built in Python, uh, but on top of, of popular uh, technologies and NumPy, Desk, X-Ray. Uh, our team has done a has done a careful study on this, and recently uh, we released a, a prototyping, which is now available to the to the community. So if you're interested in this, uh, have a look at uh, at this website here. It's basically uh, consists of a lot of documentation in kind of the same format as as the Casa Docs. Um, I have one slide here with a bit more detail, but but I'm I think I'm running fairly late already. So you can see here what's in this demonstration package. So so it, it gives you a bit of an overview of visibility data structure, and image data structures, um, X-ray data sets, uh, stuff is nat natively parallelized to Dask. Um, and if you if you look in this data data set, this is not a, a full collection of all all CASA tasks. This is really uh, meant to, to demonstrate the, the technology. Um, and you can see some benchmarking that has been done by a few of our team members as well. And you can see uh, very, very nice improvements of, of processing time as well. And, and Ryan is heavily involved in this, and I'm sure if there's questions, he can also uh, tell you much more about this. And the whole idea is also that eventually uh, we're thinking also about the next generation software. So something that's designed and de developed a uh, scientific package on top of this next generation infrastructure, which again aligns with the needs and requirements for a next generation VLA, but, but which will, will also be very valuable for existing telescopes. So kind of the idea that what we have now in CASA is, is a whole lot of information, a whole lot of coding, a uh, large number of coding lines and cleaning that up and, and using NG, CNGI CASA with off-the-shelf technology and build a next generation CASA software package on top of that. Um, so let me, let me finish with some conclusions. Uh, CASA is a very versatile and, and a leading radio data processing software. Uh, it's publicly available. You can download it as an all-inclusive DAW file, or you can go through PIPWheel installation. Uh, it supports a large number of use cases. You can use it for manual processing, uh, scripting. Uh, it runs pipelines. You can now also use it within notebooks. Uh, and the primary resource for users is Casadoc. So that's a, that will be a, a good place to start if you're not familiar with, with the Casa software yet.
Uh, the Casa software has been around for quite a while, so it's a stable software package. Uh, but like I showed you, there are, there are recent ongoing efforts for next generation Casa and Casa infrastructure. So the future for radio astronomy looks looks very bright. Um, I hope you you enjoy this talk. If you have any questions or feedback, uh, please send us an, an email. I put the email address here at the bottom. And thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any, any questions. <laughs>